From AD 52 to 55, the Apostle Paul's ministry in Ephesus resulted in a new church that began preaching the gospel. During that time, a man named Epaphras was deeply impacted by the gospel and resolved to take it back to his hometown. He was from Colossae. Epaphras returned to his hometown and in faith began the hard work of planting the Colossian church. In AD 62, Epaphras visited Rome where Paul was imprisoned. He shared with Paul the news of a strange teaching that was rising up and threatening the health and vitality of the Colossian church. The Colossians were being enticed away from the gospel through forms of asceticism and the worship of angels. In other words, they were being taught that Jesus wasn't enough. They were being distracted with man-made religion. They were drifting with the tide of their culture. They were buying into the false hope that the Roman Empire would offer them ultimate comfort and security. Although Paul had never been there, he was deeply concerned out of his great love for the people of this church. Therefore, he set out to write a pastoral letter from prison that would remind them that God had already accepted them by virtue of their connection and identity with Christ alone. What those in the church at Colossae needed to be taught and reminded of then, we need just as much today. In the face of opposition, distractions, and false teaching, we are to stand in Christ against the flow. Well, good morning. Welcome to the 10 a.m. gathering here at Life Church. My name is John, and whether you call this place home or you're new, kind of kicking the tires to see what we're about, we are thrilled to have you here today as we have been journeying through the book of Colossians together. And so I'm going to give you time to look for the book of Colossians, either in a Bible or a Bible app. We'll be in Colossians chapter Four this morning, chapter four, as we wrap up our series through Colossians. So while you're looking for that in your Bible or Bible app, two pieces of housekeeping, you'll want to know these two things. The first is that next Sunday, we have a guest speaker, Miss Margie Lawrence from right here in Saginaw. Uh, Margie spoke here a, a couple months ago and basically She's someone that I ran into while shopping. It was just a crazy God story, you could say, that we just kind of ran into each other and started talking and learned that we had shared faiths. And she has a very interesting background, lots of life experience. And so Margie will be here next Sunday sharing, encouraging you, motivating you. If you are down in the dumps or you're going through a tough time, you want to be here next Sunday because Margie will get you fired up and you're going to have a blast with her. So that's next Sunday, guest speaker. And then two weeks from now is July 4th weekend. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in Iowa where we would blow things up. You know, we'd get firecrackers, we'd get uh, anything you could light on fire, we'd find a squirrel and then boom. And so uh, July 4th weekend, we traditionally close down. We don't have a worship gathering because we want to give our volunteers a break and give you a break. So two weeks from sun today, two weeks from now, don't, don't come here. We won't be open. We'll be closed for the weekend. Uh, I'd encourage you to go and visit another church community. Like seriously, you can. We are friends. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. It's not like we're in gangs or something. You can visit another church and uh, either you'll go there and you'll be refreshed or, or you might go there and go, oh, oh, that's why I go to Life Church because I like that they do it this way. Uh, but either way, two weeks from now, uh, no worship gathering. And then we start back up the second Sunday in July with a brand new series about the underground church. It's really cool. You're not going to want to miss it. So just some pieces of housekeeping as we are moving through the summer. The book of Colossians was written 2,000 years ago by Paul. He is in Rome. He's under house arrest. He's writing Colossians at the same time that he's writing Ephesians and another book called Philemon. And I even hate to call Philemon a book because it's like half a page in your Bible. Like you could bang out Philemon during a commercial break. Uh, but all three of these books are going to kind of converge in Colossians chapter 4. We're going to hear from Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. 
The whole reason Paul's writing Colossians is because the teachers in Colossae had been teaching that Jesus was like an angel, like he's this created being between God and man. And, you know, you got to really go big on religion and go small on Jesus. And Paul says, no, 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 no. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Don't go big on religion and go little on Jesus. He says, go big on Jesus and go little on religion. Jesus is huge. So chapter one of Colossians is all about who is Jesus, the beloved son of the father, the heir of all things. And then chapter two of Colossians is um, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, that he is big enough to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. And then chapter three is, you know, kind of how do I live this out? We looked at that last week and you can get all the videos on our website and on our YouTube. But today is chapter four. And generally in these ancient writings, um, these were letters that they would write to a, a community, a church. And at the end of the letter, they would kind of do shout outs. They do kind of call outs to different people that were in the congregation to give them encouragement or to give them a reprimand if they needed that. And, and then at the very end, the, the writer would kind of sign his name. Um, he was dictating the letter to someone, but, but he would maybe sign it with his own hand. And Paul does that with Colossians. So Colossians 4 is going to end with just a couple quick little hit bits and then some shout outs that we want to look at. Uh, it's interesting. It starts out with this. Colossians 4.1 kind of just out of nowhere gives this piece of advice. It says, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. So in the congregation, there were Roman citizens, and in ancient Rome, you would have bond servants. You'd have men and women who served you, and it's not like, it's not like American slavery. It's not that at all. That's why I like this translation. It says bond servants, because as a bond servant, um, you were treated really well. You were educated, you were paid, and you were released from servitude around age 30. And then you were a free person and you were kind of adopted by the family that you'd been serving. So you had a new name, a new identity. And so Paul says, masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly because you have a master also. He's above you in heaven. Now, why would Paul all of a sudden insert this into his letter? What is he getting at? Paul's writing three letters at the same time in Rome. He's writing Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon. And I think the insertion about masters and bond servants might have something to do with that third lever, Philemon. He's got his mind on Philemon. Philemon was a guy who lived in Colossae, went to this house church in Colossae, and he had lots of servants. One of his servants ran away, a servant named Onesimus. And, and so um, the letter that... Paul is writing the Colossae is going to be accompanied by a letter to Philemon. Once the had run away from his master, but he wants to return. Why? Well, because slaves belong to the households of the wealthy and they were treated better than the poor people in society. Here's the problem, though. Once the had pocketed cash. He got the cash because he was the oikonomist. That's where we get the word economy. He was the oikonomist. He was the steward. So if you were rich, if you were powerful, and you were traveling, they didn't have banks back then, you could carry all your riches with you, but then you were opening yourself up to be mugged, to having somebody steal all your money. So you would instead entrust your wealth, your riches, to an oikonomist, a steward who would take care of your money and steward it well. That's why in church world, we talk about stewarding God's resources well. It's all God's stuff. So Onesimus has all of Philemon's stuff. 
He has his bank account, his riches, and he runs out of town. He takes the cash with him. And now he wants to return, but he's like, man, I'm going to get in so much trouble with Philemon. I, I need some help. I need a letter from Paul. He runs to Paul in Rome. But here, here's my question. Why did Onesimus go to Paul of all people? Why would, would he risk his life to travel that far all the way to Rome to find this guy who's under house arrest and isn't very famous at the time and is part of this cult called Christianity? Why did he run to Paul? That's what I want to investigate for a minute. This is really interesting if you're a history buff like I am. So back in ancient times, there was a lot of zealotry. There were people that were Hebrews, that were Jews, that wanted to overthrow the Roman occupation. And so they were called zealots, zealots. And Rome would punish entire villages of zealots. Sometimes they do it through crucifixion. They would crucify people and they would nail the crosses along the, the road. So as you're going to the grocery stores, you're going to Meyer or Walmart, you'd see these guys up on the crosses and it was Rome's way of saying, hey, if you get out of line, you're gonna end up like these guys. Uh, another thing they would do though is they would sack a rebel village and sell them into bond servitude, into slavery. And so back in ancient times, there was this little village in northern Galilee. Now, Galilee should ring a bell for you. Ding, 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 ding. Because Galilee is where Jesus did most of his ministry, most of his teaching. All throughout these little villages in northern Galilee. There was a village called Gishala. In history records, that, that entire village was carted off. It was full of zealots. People who wanted to overthrow Rome. And so Rome arrests them all, ships them off to be slaves. Among the people in Gishala that were carted off were Paul's parents. In 382 AD, Jerome was commissioned by the Pope to write uh, some words about the letter to Philemon. And in that ancient document, Jerome wrote these words that are up on the screen. They say that the parents of the Apostle Paul were from Gishala, a region of Judea, and that when the whole province was devastated by the hand of Rome and the Jews were scattered throughout the world, they were moved to Tarsus, a town of Cilicia. So they were moved, they were uprooted from their Hebrew Jewish home all the way to Tarsus. And if you know the story of Paul, how is he introduced in the book of Acts as Paul of Tarsus? And Roman slaves were typically freed around age 30 and then they were granted citizenship. So you have Paul born in Tarsus to his slave parents that means in his earliest years as a child, as a teenager, he would have been doing the work of a slave. He would have been in chains. This puts a whole new spin on Paul's writings when he talks about being in chains for Christ. Masters are in heaven. Make sure that you treat your bond servants justly and well. Because he was freed when he was 30 years old, Paul was both a citizen of Rome and a Hebrew, a very rare combination. This combination was used by God strategically. As a Hebrew, he's able to go to the Jews and talk about Jesus. As a Roman citizen, he's able to go from town to town, city to city, without any fear of, of being arrested because he's a citizen. He speaks dual languages. It's like he's got dual citizenship. That's Paul. And so Paul is met by Onesimus. Onesimus explains his situation. He's like, listen, I want to go back to Philemon, but I stole some money. Can you help a brother out? So Paul writes to Philemon 
saying to receive once in his back because he is no longer a slave, but better than a slave, he is a dear brother. He writes that in the letter to Philemon. And you get this kind of convergence in Philemon and in Colossians and in Ephesians, this encouragement to treat others equally. Like if you're a master and you have servants, don't be a jerk to the servants. Treat them with equality because in Christ, we are all under one master. So in Colossians 4.1, he says, Masters, treat your bond servants with kindness. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, You know that both of you have the same master in heaven. With him, there is no partiality. And so in Christ, we have this radical inclusiveness where it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, free or slave, male or female, Roman, non-Roman. In Christ, we are all brothers and sisters. We are a family. The congregation of God is a family and we're all equal in God's sight. So we don't treat somebody as lesser than. We treat each other with love and kindness and respect. It's a whole new way of living among all the Romans. who were all about class systems. So Paul also had a right-hand man named Timothy. He writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, because Timothy ends up becoming the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And then he works his way up and becomes the bishop of Ephesus. So he's like a, a pastor to the pastors. He's kind of like in charge of all the little house churches in Ephesus. Timothy was the first bishop of the churches in Ephesus. And, and he built up a roster of pastors underneath him. One of Timothy's pastors was known as a true shepherd of shepherds, a pastor to pastors. He would visit those in prison. He would help care for orphans and for widows, which in Roman times, they were thrown to the streets. He understood the marginalized as if he himself was once marginalized. And so when it was time to choose a new bishop after Timothy's martyrdom, there was an obvious choice. The Ephesian church chose the shepherd of shepherds. They chose the man who had served skillfully for decades and who in old age would also be killed by Rome. And that man's name was Onesimus. This runaway slave who should have been punished but instead was accepted back into the church of Colossae by Philemon eventually becomes a pastor of pastors, a teacher of teachers, a shepherd of shepherds. He eventually becomes the bishop after Timothy, overseeing all the churches of Ephesus. And so Paul says, this is why we treat each other equally with respect and kindness and love. Even if we don't know each other's name, we're in the same place and we can show each other respect. He goes on in Colossians chapter 4. He writes these verses in verses 2, 3, and 4. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. We'll put this up on the screen. No, we won't. We'll pull this out of our Bibles. Our screen just went blank. He's going to say to continue steadfastly in prayer. He's going to turn his attention to prayer for just a moment. So for our prayer warriors, this really speaks to us. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. And this passage Verses 2, 3, and 4, chapter 4. This passage is called the three open prayer. The three open prayer. I learned this 
from a man named Ron Hutchcraft. So um, my story is that I grew up in a church, a very traditional country church in Iowa, and I, I prayed to receive Christ when I was like five years old. And then as a teenager, I kind of fumbled around in my faith, didn't always take it seriously. But I remember this one weekend, my parents shuttled me off to Illinois, to the city called Peoria. Now, Peoria is not like anything special. Um, it's kind of like the armpit of Illinois. And uh, really, it is. But we went to this church to hear this guest speaker at this large church. It was my first time ever being in a big church where I just didn't know everybody. And the speaker was this evangelist named Ron Hutchcraft. And you can Google Ron Hutchcraft later. He's done a lot of amazing work with teenagers and with Native American tribes throughout the United States. And Ron Hutchcraft spoke and he gave this amazing message. And then he gave an altar call, which if you're new to church world, an altar call is where the pastor or the preacher says, okay, if you want to receive Christ, come forward, come to the front here, we'll pray together. And uh, so I went forward, I was already you know, a follower of Christ, but that was my first time experiencing like an altar call experience. And so I started listening to Ron Hutchcraft's radio program, which was on the local Christian radio station on Saturday nights. It was called Saturday Night Alive. It was a takeoff of Saturday Night Live. And uh, I remember I called in one night and I was so excited because I got to talk to Ron Hutchcraft on the radio. And like years later, when I got into youth ministry, we went to this big outdoor festival. It was like an outdoor camping thing that you brought youth to and bring teenagers to. And I remember uh, <laughs> our youth group was so dysfunctional that we took one student. <laughs> it was me, my wife, and one student, which was really weird. And so we kind of just were, you know, listening to the different speakers and listening to the bands. And we went to this tent where you could meet the speakers. And one of the speakers was Rod Hutchcraft. And I told him, hey, thank you for teaching me the three open prayer all those years ago when you spoke at this church in Peoria, Illinois, because I've always remembered from the book of Colossians, the three open prayer. I'm going to share it with you. It's very simple. It's a simple prayer that you can pray that is beneficial to the church. Okay, the three open prayer is to pray uh, for open doors open hearts and open mouths. What Paul says is pray that there would be doors that open for me to share the gospel. Pray that their hearts would be open to receiving the gospel. And then pray that I would be bold enough to speak the gospel. Open doors, open hearts, open mouths. And that's what you see in Colossians 4 verses two through four, which is continue steadfastly in prayer, be watchful in it with thanksgiving. So being devoted to prayer, and at the same time, pray for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, and that I might make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So open door, open hearts, open mouth. That's an easy way that you can pray for our church. Pray that God would open up doorways of opportunity for us to step through. Pray that, that the people that we speak to, that we reach, would have open hearts, that they wouldn't be closed off. And then pray that we would open our mouths and, and declare the goodness, the forgiveness, the wholeness that we can experience in Christ Jesus. Paul continues in his letter. And he starts doing shout outs to individuals who are in the church. He says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activity. So Tychicus is going to explain to you why I, Paul, am in prison, why I'm suffering in chains. He'll explain the whole story. He's a beloved brother. He's a faithful minister and he's a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. So Onesimus, this runaway slave who is wanting to come back into community in the church, wanting to come back to his master Philemon, 
he gets a shout out in the Bible. He continues and says that Epaphras, who is one of you in the church, he's a servant, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. So there's that, that whole slavery and a master, that whole imagery again, that we are here to serve the Lord. We're here to serve God. In fact, if you go back to chapter 3, I don't have a slide for this, but if you go back to chapter 3, it says in verse 23 that whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that you will receive your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So whatever you do at work or at home or your daily life, Pretend that you're doing it for Jesus because you really are. Ultimately, he is the master. We're the servants. So Epaphras, he's one of you. He's a servant of Christ Jesus. He greets you. He's always struggling on your behalf in prayer. Can you imagine someone praying for you? And they're praying with so much zeal, with so much passion, that they're struggling in prayer for you. You can be that person. You don't need to have a spiritual gift. You can pray for others with tremendous heart and honest audacity before the Lord and pray for this person so that you're struggling for them, that they might stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Paul says, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Uh, just a little bit of Bible trivia for those of you who are Bible nerds like me. Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans that's lost to history. There are letters from Paul that we've just lost. There was another letter to the Corinthians. So there was actually a third Corinthians. There's a letter to the Laodiceans. His heart is for all these churches, not just one church in particular. He wants these letters read to all the churches. That's why at Life Church we say we are friends. We are cheering for all the ministries, all the churches, because we are not competing with each other. We're hopefully helping complete the body of Christ. And so we can cheer for the church on the corner and cheer for the church. As we drive by, we can say a quick prayer to God, asking for blessing for that church or that ministry. Paul goes on in verse 14, and he says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. And this is an interesting line because Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And it's here in this verse in Colossians that we learn that he is a physician. He is a doctor. Nowhere else in scripture do we get that. So that tells us a lot about Luke when he writes his gospel, when he writes the book of Acts. He's looking at things with a very analytical, scientific mind, bringing to us all the facts. Luke greets you as does Demas. And circle that name, Demas. Because here in the book of Colossians, Demas is a faithful co-worker with Paul. He's in Rome with Paul, in the jail cell, helping Paul get these letters pumped out to encourage and to instruct other churches. Demas gets mentioned in other letters of Paul that I want to point out to you. In Philemon, chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says that Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, remember the prayer warrior? He sends greetings to you, and so do Mark. Mark, who's the author of the Gospel of Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So two authors of two Gospels, Mark and Luke, are with Paul. And then you've got Demas right there, being a fellow co-worker, helping to get the gospel out. I wonder what happened to Demas. We find out in Paul's final letter, which is 2 Timothy. In chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas, who was 
Paul's right-hand man who gets two shout-outs in Scripture saying he's with me and he's, he's helping to get the word out and he's doing the work of God. At the end of his life, Demas short-circuited somewhere. He fell in, thing, fell in love with the things of this world and he deserts Paul, which should stand as a stark warning to all of us that you can be on fire for God one day but the things of this world can cloud your judgment and cloud your mind the next day. And so to beware, be aware, be like Epaphras, be fervent in prayer that you not fall to the side in following God. And then finally, Paul wraps up his letter in verse 18 saying, I, Paul, Write this greeting with my own hand. He did this because Paul would dictate his letters. That's an ancient practice. So like the Gospel of Mark was a dictation from Peter. Peter was dictating to Mark what to write down. The same with these letters. The letter to the Colossians was dictated to somebody else. Maybe it was Demas. Maybe it was Epaphras. But Paul then took the paper, took the pen, and he kind of did a little chicken scratch. He said, I, Paul, write this with my own hand as if to authenticate the letter to say, this isn't a fake. This isn't someone using my name. I am actually here present writing this with my own chicken scratch. And then he says, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Remember my chains. So again, that whole being a bond servant for Christ serving a higher master. Remember my change. Remember what put me here. Sharing the gospel got me in jail. Remember that this is a life or death ordeal. This church thing is not meant to be safe. Doing the will of God means rocking and turning over some tables. Remember my chains. And then he says, grace be with you all which if you go to Colossians chapter one, it opens with him saying, grace be with you, and it ends with grace be with you. It bookends with grace, grace, grace. Grace is all, or to echo the words of Colossians, Christ is all. Let me pray for you guys. Lord God, thank you for this short book of the Bible, Colossians. Thank you for the challenge you've been giving to us these last few weeks. We've been individually impacted by different words that the Holy Spirit has placed on our hearts. So Lord, would you help us to move forward with those challenges, whether it's a challenge to pray, whether it's a challenge to be bold, whatever that challenge may be for us individually, Lord, would you give us the faith to press forward with confidence and boldness in Christ Jesus? Lord, we turn our attention to worship, to worshiping you through the lyrics of this final song together, to the giving of our tithes and offerings, that these may be used for your glory. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.